Hey, hey, everybody, welcome back to Board Game Blender. My name is Z Garcia. Today we are going to be talking about fancy components in games. Uh, components, it seems, have truly taken a leap, leaps and bounds in the last few years to truly immerse us in, their, in the game's world. You know, they are so fantastic these days, the things they can do. Not to mention artwork. We're, we're not even tackling artwork, but just components, how wonderfully designed and, and constructed they are. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh, come on now, Z. That is all the effect of Kickstarter and, and what Kickstarter has done for components, making, making it seem, if not in some ways uh, it being true, that components are more important than even the gameplay and the design of that game. And in many ways, yes, I agree with you. There are a lot of games that come out of Kickstarter where the components would appear to be more important and integral to the uh, to the you know the play experience than the game play itself. But that's not really what we're talking about here today. And and it's possible you will see Kickstarter games in the episode, even deluxe versions of Kickstarter games because they are part of our wor world, our hobby, you know. But what I'm talking about here is just that rising tide of of game components, game elements, game artwork, just just getting better every year it seems and it's a it's the best time to be a gamer that there has been you can find now good components good artwork clever design in in so many places from so many people and that's kind of what i wanted to talk about today you know things that just truly en engage us so i uh, hope you find some cool looking games in here some awesome components and Again, uh, components that are backed up by good games as well. So enjoy the episode, uh, find some new favorites, and let's have some fun. Here we go. Hi, I'm Daniele and this is Play Cool. Uh, today, in two pros and two cons, we are talking about potion explosion. As a kid, I would create uh, potions uh, with uh, ingredients taken from the kitchen or from my games and uh, mix paint with uh, orange juice, water and coke and, uh, and create uh, a wonderful potion that I would say would be, I don't know, some kind of magical potion uh, I would uh, luckily not drink it, uh, but uh, with my brother and sister, we sometimes would, would play something like that and we would have fun. Uh, uh, with my father then, uh, I would often play on the sand in particular with marbles uh, on the beach and we would uh, spend the time like that with marbles. It's two things I loved in the past, but there are games now like mobile games that would take your whole time if you let them and uh, uh, for the kids, it's, it's mostly like that, uh, I see. Uh, there are now, however, options to get out of the hole. And uh, one of the options is Potion Explosions. This is an app uh, made into a board game and it's wonderfully done. It's a very simple game. You can play it with anyone, even with a kid that only plays with mobile apps and uh, you have a toy factor that's the first and biggest pro for this game and I'm already saying it, it's wonderfully done. So, give me a sec. <sighs> Wasn't it cool? I mean, when you get a ball, everything slides down and uh, it, it clicks. It uh, reminds you of the apps that you've seen because also when you take a marble, if then uh, two other marble touch that are of the same color, then you would take those as well. And if other two touch that are of the same color, you would take those as well. And you finish up with all these marbles in your hand and you feel like a baby. Again, so happy. And then you can use those marbles, you put them in your potions where it's needed, 
the yellow ones on the yellow ones, the red ones on the red ones. But this game is fast, this game is simple, this game is great. Um, and this is the second big plus. It's, it can be played really with anyone. So what are the cons, you say? There are small things like it's a casual game and it's fine like that, but it's really swingy. And the, it's not really a competitive game like a strategy game. You have fun with it though, so it's fine by me. And the second con is this toy, which was my biggest pro for the game. It's a pain to set up. It's really a pain. So get some glue, get some a lot of patience and the first time you set it up use the glue so that you are sure that everything is set up correctly and you don't have to touch it again put it in the box like that don't have to touch it again and hope that it doesn't fall apart um, but once it's set up it's really actually pretty sturdy and working fine so this is uh this has been two pros and two cons and uh have fun but until the next episode thanks for Oh, no, that's another show. For today's game, Under the Radar, I'm going to be talking about a game called North Wind from the same designer as it very uh, proudly proclaims on the box as Catan. Or in this case, it still was called the Settlers of Catan. But anyway, uh, this is from that same designer and the game is actually an evolution of a Catan game originally, a game for only two players called Starship Catan, in which uh, you uh, would, would do some exploration out in space, discover some tiles, try to... Uh, it, it, it felt very much like an exploration game. You were revealing new tiles and seeing what you encountered. This game retains many of uh, those uh, sort of emotions that the original one triggered, but then now this game is for two to four players, it has, of course, a piratey sort of theme, a, an adventuring high seas theme, and it's much more colorful, much more engaging to a wide audience, which is partly why it surprises me that the game has, in many ways, flown under the radar. So, the reason it's on the list, and, uh, and the reason I think it, it, it has some standout components that would be truly engaging for... Uh, both gamers and families that perhaps are, you know, bringing in a, a teenager, let's say, to play with everyone else. The game has really great tiles, that's fine, that's to be expected these days. As I said in the intro, you can find great tiles everywhere, nice wooden components, you know, and these are very nice, chunky, beautifully done components. But again, this is something you can find in many places. Nice tray too, by the way. I do want to mention that this is a removable tray that comes with the game. Nice touch. But the main uh, highlight here is this beautiful ship. There's one of these per player. And you can see another one here without the mast in it. But these you construct the first time you play. They will sit back in the box constructed as long as you remove the, uh, the mast there. Just like I did there. This will just sit on the table like so, and the ship is really just, it's a, it's a placeholder. I mean, it just holds the stuff that's loaded on the ship. But what a beautiful production this is. And so as you can see, you will put components onto the ship and it will hold them in those different spots. And then you also have here for the speed, the, the how quickly you are exploring, you can move the sail here higher and higher on the mast there's a number right there next to it and it it just visually tracks everything that's going on while kicking up that theme so much it's a beautiful design and then you've also got up here of course the the lookout right there so it's just a really really nice production this ship they are fantastic pieces they elevate the whole thing with the, the beautiful theme, the beautiful components. Artwork is very nice, and there's a little bit of a player aid right here on the, on the back of the ship as well to help you remember some things. But again, ultimately, this is just replacing a, a player aid or you know a player's board as sort of a holding area. So is this a good idea? I've, I keep talking about how beautiful it is. Oh, there's also, I should mention, you can put cannons on this bad boy. There you go, like so. Ah, destroying the ship. Destroying the ship. There we go. 
Come on, buddy. Hey, I'm showing you a how to build it also while I'm at it. Anyway, you can put cannons on the sides of this, like so, and you, you got the little notches for them right there. And again, just a visual representation of, hey, you have cannons. Love it. So, this is very attractive, as I've said, but is it, am I glad it's in there? Is it worth it? Does it make the game better, more interesting? Do they charge you more because it's in there? Uh, I'll start with that last one. This game is actually not that expensive for the kind of game it is, because you are just building these out of cardboard. So it's the same cost to give you a cardboard punch out that you then have to fold and build. So I'm happy with that. And I do think that this elevates the gameplay. Gameplay is very nice. You know, you are flipping over tiles, exploring, grabbing goods, spending those goods again, gathering, uh, you know, your victory points. But I think having one of these in front of you is going to allow everyone to do a little bit more role playing, get into the theme, get into that high seas vibe, and just being able to store the things in a very visually appealing way, manipulate your sail, put a little dude up here, all those things elevate this game. A lot of games out there will give you components that do not elevate the game, the game play experience, the engagement, right? This is a, an experience we're engaging in. I think this kind of touch does as long as it does not come coupled with fiddliness. That's the killer for me, right? If the game has some beautiful thing you're meant to display, manipulate, whatever, but it adds fiddliness where there would not have been any, then it's a problem. This game, besides having to build the ships the first time, uh, and you know, you'll figure that out, put it together, you're good, does not add any fiddliness. Everything sits in the, in the spots for it very well. Moving this is quite easy. So I'm very happy with this design. This is a great game, and sadly, not does not get a lot of attention. I don't know why. You know, it's the kind of game that I think would truly appeal to to families. It's uh, it's got that weight. It's got that involvement. It's not a long game. This is a beautiful production, and I would recommend it. Uh, for lots of different groups, I think if you are someone who is okay with a little luck. You like a little bit of that, you like resource management, and uh, you enjoy this theme and the splashy bright look, you should be looking into it. Give this game some love, because it is certainly flying under the radar. So, that's it for this one, folks. Northwind, very nice production, gorgeous ships, and criminally underrepresented, so go check it out. That's under the radar, I'll see you all later. Uh, boop, 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 boop. Is that? Oh, which one? I got um, a bunch of uh, really nice... You don't nice have to worry about it. It's okay. What? Fine. Don't worry about it. What? Oh, uh, well, it's your turn. So, okay. uh, what you do is you roll and... Oops! Jeez. Where does the dice even go? Do, do, do. Send up to Kaido. Love this game. Hehehe. <laughs> these are imports. And then... <clears throat> This has to stop. You have to stop. You're stealing all of the treasure bits from all of our games. No, I'm not. Oh, uh, yeah, really? Well, what's that big pile of treasure in front of you? <laughs> okay, uh, listen. How about this? I have a game that I will trade you for all of the bits for all of those games. What game is worth that? Ooh. Ah. Uh -huh. That has a play. Well, it's 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 good. It's it's fine. It's it's kind of middling actually. It's it's pretty chaotic, but uh, but it's pretty. It's very pretty. Does it have gold? Does it have gold? Not only does it have gold. Not only is it about gold. It's made of gold. So is Dragoon worth all that treasure? Well, if you take it just for the game, then kind of eh. I mean. It's a simplistic game. You roll some dice, you move some dragons, you claim some towns or destroy them, and you get some gold. But there's not much to it. Where it really is amazing is the bits. This is a showpiece game. It's got real metal for the dragons, you know, these nice tiles. The, the cloth map reminds me of when I was a kid and I'd get these video games with cloth maps. You know, it, it really tickles me. And, you know, you get these nice player bags for the individual. It, it's just 
it's an amazing piece of design work. It's gorgeous, you know, it, it feels good to play with. And there's even a collector's edition that has real gold and silver. You know, it, it will stand out on your table. And if you're looking for something like that, then it's perfect. If you want something that's more like heavy tactical strategy, you're gonna have to go someplace else. But for a showpiece, this is going in the hoard. Caviar and champagne, it all tastes the same. Why don't you give me bling bling? I don't care what you say, I don't want to play unless you give me bling bling. I don't want to come in your catacomb if your plastic is all gray. Wooden cubies are for poppers. I want it proper. Mm, okay? Sheep is not sheep, I don't want to play. Why don't you give me bling bling? Your diamonds better be from Cartier. I only want the bling bling. No tokens when you hurt, you bleed. Your family will starve when you forget to feed. Components will make you feel. Come by tonight, we're playing cash and gun for real. If the art is not art, I don't want to play. Why don't you give me bling bling? All boxes should come with an insert tray. I only want the bling bling. For today's quirky game, I'm taking a look at a game called, here we go, Auf Teufel komm Haus. And if you speak or understand German, I would like to apologize to you for whatever I just said. This game is, is literally four components, and they're all, they're all awesome, fancy components. I, I feel like the box should be one of them, actually. Here's the box. Check that box out. This dude is fancy times, that, that devil. And uh, this is a pusher lug game, a very simple pusher lug game, which, as you can tell, comes in a, in a big square box. And as I said, there are four components, all of them very nice. The least nice is the board, actually, which has quite uh, attractive artwork. And uh, I'll open it up here and show you, but it's just a board, you know, it's really just a placeholder with a score track around it. You just are going to put some tokens on there and then grab them and flip them and push your luck. Even the back is very nice. Uh, with the, the designs there, the tridents, and then the other components. I'll start with, again, I'll sort of work my way up here to the nicer components. Player pawns. But oh my goodness, these are huge player pawns. These are nice, they're wooden, they're very thick and chunky, but they're, they're quite large, so there is that. Then we've got the pieces that the players are pulling. It's coal. These wooden pieces here are coal, and you're going to grab one from the big cauldron there, flip it over, you might get some points, but every now and then if you push your luck too much, you're going to get one of these, and you flip it over, oh, it's the devil, and you have just pushed your luck, and you, you bust it, and uh, that's it, that's what you're doing, you're, you're pushing your luck, flipping these over, after you've made a bit of how much you think you are going to get. I'm not going to get into all the rules or anything, I'm just going to give you an idea of how it works. And then lastly, so that was the board, the tokens, the coal pieces, and then lastly comes the money, the way you keep scoring the game, and this is poker chips. And these, I think, are the best poker chips 
in any game I've ever seen with poker chips. These are the real deal. These are nice, heavy. I'm assuming these are the, you know, the fancy 11 gram ones. They have a, uh, a printed and they are, they're not quite screen printed, but they do not rub off a uh, little sticker or whatever they are there. And they have a little shine to them. So it's a little bit of a metallic ink deal going on. And these are just fantastic pieces attractive, bright, wonderful to hold and mess with. They got that nice clinky sound to them. And you got a bag of these bad boys. I've actually ended up uh, getting rid of the insert in the game, so it's just an empty box right now, and I've bagged everything because these things are so good and so heavy that the vacuum uh, insert, you know, vacuum created ones, the plastic ones, it, it gave up, it, it threw in the flag and it just, you know, so I finally, it was cracking, I got rid of it, and I bagged everything, and it is just, bringing this game out will make people giddy, because everything in it, and there's so few components, but they are all fantastic, that it's so well made, so, so much attention to, to detail has gone into this game. Now, uh, mentioning, going back to what I've said before here about fancy components, are they worth it? I think sometimes these these uh, components are worth it and will elevate a game. And I, I agree that that's the case here. I think these components make this game more enjoyable to play, to fiddle with, to, to partake in. Does that translate, though, into is it worth it, both money-wise and size-wise? And in this game, I'm not sure. This is not a game that I would necessarily say, go grab it. You know, go get it right now because you're super going to enjoy it. This is a game that could have been designed in a box that is smaller than his belly, you know? And, and they didn't. They gave you this fancy version. It is not a deluxe version. It is the only version. But I would first say, unless the, you get the game very cheaply, and, and you have the room, that's another consideration us gamers have to consider, right? Uh, that you might want to try this one first. You know, I enjoy the game very much. I think it's a it's a great, you know, a push your luck, laugh out loud kind of game. You're going to have a lot of those moments. The rules are simple and straightforward. There is a lot of messing with the other players as well with that. There's a little bit of a bidding system that if you uh, if you bust a few times, if you fall really low on the scoring track, other players might end up paying you for revealing those little devils. Um, so there's, there's a lot here to like. It's a very well done game, but it tiptoes that line for me between, oh yeah, awesome that they went ahead and included all these fantastic components, and man, I kind of wish I had a version I could just throw in my backpack and take with me, or you know, add to a carrying case that, that's much smaller. Because the game is small, the game play is small. It's a small game but they don't package it that way. I like it, I'm happy, I have it, I enjoy the game very much as I said, and I think it does help sell it. it. As in, when I sit down at the table and gather people around the game, they are more willing to jump right in with all this custom stuff. But I'm not sure I would blindly say, go get it, unless again, you can get it on the cheap. Having said all that, really cool stuff, definitely a quirky game, both with the theme with all the components and with the gameplay. This idea of, I think I'm gonna reveal this much as a total, and then you start doing so, but all you gotta do is have someone make the total you said. So if I say I'm gonna reveal 50, someone else says I'm gonna reveal 100. If they pass 50, I'm good. And they're just gonna keep going because they want 100. And so I'm happy with that. Of course, it's quite possible that they'll keep flipping and actually just continue flipping to bust and not give me my 50. So it's like, it's a quirky game for sure, the design of it, you know, but also, as you can clearly see, in the components department. So that's it for me. Uh, auf Teufel komm raus. <laughs> I'm just gonna keep saying that wrong, I'm sure. Uh, is one that I'm very happy to own. And if you enjoy bizarre, quirky games, maybe a little less known, then this is one that I would look into, maybe find someone who has a copy and play, maybe try to find a cheap one and, and purchase it if it's something that really appeals to you. So there you have it. That is our quirky game of the episode.
Howdy folks, welcome to Two Player Showdown. I'm Rebecca. I'm Hunter. And today we're going to talk about a beautiful game that is near and dear and new to our hearts, and that is... Yamatai. Yamatai plays two to four players. It takes uh, about an hour. Days of Wonder always knocks it out of the park in production value, and it holds true with this wonderful game where you're trying to build the capital city of Yamatai. For Queen Humoko's smile. Let's take a closer look. So what makes this game blinged out, you might ask? I would say easily that, for one thing, they use beautiful artwork. And I think that can make or break a game, you know, in by building interest just straight off the, you know, the bat. And this is really beautiful. It's got bright, vibrant colors, beautiful art on all of the boards and the player mats and even the... Um, specialist tiles, all of it is really gorgeous. The other thing I would say is that a lot of games tend to lower the price points and just do the little cardboard chits for everything from currency to the marker pieces or whatnot. And here they used wooden pieces and they're all different colors for the different teams, for the different types of buildings, your meeples, the boats, everything. Um, that's a major part of the game is that you're putting on the map is all in these little wooden pieces. I agree, the game would not be the same if it was a big pile of cardboard. These big wooden components for the buildings and the palaces and the boats and your little meeples and everything just makes this game pop and it immediately has table appeal. Um, if you're walking by and you see this game being played, you'll, you'll It'll catch your eye, and if it was just a pile of cardboard, which it could have easily been, I mean, it's not Days of Wonder style, but it could have easily been just a big pile of cardboard, um, it wouldn't have that appeal. And I don't think it would be as interesting. I mean, it's really, really fun to put big wooden pieces on the board and, and put your little wooden boats down. That's actually just what I was going to say. There's some special appeal about grabbing a physical 3D object and maneuvering and manipulating it around the board. And it's not nearly as interesting if you're just flipping little pieces of cardboard into position here and there. And the one exception to this, I would say, is the money in this game because they're not metal coins or anything, but they're still, again, they're cardboard, but they're beautiful. They've got different shaped little centers punched out of them in the, the style of the coinage, but it's got this beautiful scrolly artwork on them as well. So it's not just a simple flat little coin that says one cent on it. All right, besides the obvious bling element of this game and how gorgeous it is, I really enjoy the the elegance and the the simplicity and the beauty of the gameplay. You really have a couple of choices. You get to put more boats down and travel and build something or you're putting your little boats down and taking something from the islands and in that simple fashion you actually have to build up quite a little strategy. Really enjoy that. Yeah, it's 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 just a really fun game. It's easy to teach and the two-player variant is um, familiar to anyone who's played Five Tribes the two-player variant is you simply take two turns each round. You have um, basically two uh, little meeples that decide which turn when you take your turn. So it's it's pretty simple to learn. Two-player, not a lot of variants, um, and it's interesting. There's actually some strategy with the two-player because yes. if you time it right, you can get four turns in a row, which is pretty crazy. So it's fun. I really enjoy a two-player. It's a great two-player game. Yes. So if you want to try a beautiful, simple yet strategic game, definitely go and check out Yamatai. Thank you so much for cool the Everybody and welcome back to Game Olympics, where we're going to award bronze, silver, and gold medals to games with awesome, fancy, blinged out fashion sense. So here we go. Taking our bronze medal is Unusual Suspects that originally, when first printed, included a baseball cap in the box with the logo of the game Unusual Suspects on the front. Now, why was this included in there? Well, 
The idea is you are looking at a display of characters and you, there's one you know that other people don't know is the one who done it, done did it. <laughs> and you, you know, the, you're supposed to wear the cap so you can hide your eyes like so and take a look at all the characters without revealing information to the other players. Sure. Uh, kind of. Now, the game has been reprinted by Cool Mini or not. They no longer include a baseball cap in there, but no big loss. However, I thought it was a, a bizarre thing to include in the game. It is not a very high quality baseball cap, which makes sense. It's squished inside of a game box, but it came in there. Um, and I guess if you wanted to, if you're the kind of person that enjoys wearing board game, you know, related t-shirts, which I do, you could also throw on that baseball cap, go out to the park and share some board game love. Our silver medal winner is Junta. Viva el Presidente! And this game includes in the box a pair of sunglasses, a pair of shades. So it's like a start player marker that when you are el Presidente, you are supposed to put on these shades and then if you're playing in a game store, probably immediately take them off again because you know it's going to be kind of dark and dingy in there. But if you were playing somewhere that is well lit like your own abode, then you can leave them on and just look cool while you are El Jefe, you know? It's a bizarre thing to include. I, they, they were, again, not very high quality. They were, they, they, they had a little bit of flash on the legs and stuff. So when you put them on, you had to be careful you didn't scratch, uh, you know, the backs of your ears or something, but but they were in there and, you know, they, they went through the trouble of including it, which is kind of cool. It makes for a great conversation piece. When you first open that box, you're like, oh, snap, everyone has to try them on. Uh, and uh, they're neat. Probably one of the coolest ways to denote whose turn it is. So, shades. If you need a cheap pair of shades and you get a game with them, then check out Junta. Viva el Presidente. And finally, our gold medal goes to the Days of Wonder printing of Queen's Necklace, which included, not particularly surprisingly, a necklace. It wasn't a Queen's necklace. It would have been your necklace if you bought the game. But it was just basically a, a string necklace with a uh, jewel on it. And you could put it on. In fact, you were supposed to put it on when you took the card, Queen's Necklace, that gave you the necklace. The rest of the time, you left it in the box. And after you played the game once, actually, you probably also left it in the box. But, just gonna put this out there. If you happen to own all three of these games, I do expect you now to throw on the shades, put on the Unusual Suspects hat, don that bling, and, uh, you know, tweet a picture at me, because I will use it somewhere. <laughs> Pro probably in something board game related. Don't, don't be scared. I'm not going to Photoshop it or anything, but I expect to see it because I know someone's got to own all three of these games, right? And a camera. So that's it for our Game Olympics in this go around awesome gaming bling that came included in the box. If you have some ideas for an upcoming Game Olympics showdown you would like to see, let me know in the comments below and I'll see you all next time. My name's Dan, and this is my ball gaming time capsule. Now then, a couple of weeks ago, I went to the Dice Tower Con, which was absolutely fantastic, by the way. And someone I met there accused me of having a very negative view of the future, which I think is a little bit unfair. After all, no one really knows what's going to happen in the future. But what we do know is that humanity is doomed. Whether we be wiped out by plague, alien invasion or thermonuclear war, all that's going to be left to society is a ragtag bunch of survivors struggling to get by in a post-apocalyptic landscape. 
And what's worse is that you just know that the people that are going to be left alive aren't going to be the useful people essential to society. They're not going to be the doctors, the engineers, the teachers and the board game designers. No, we're probably going to be left with all the useless pillocks. The fashion designers, the telemarketers and the professional Where's Waldo impersonators. The only way that a bunch of misfits like that is going to be able to survive is by working together by collaborating, by cooperating. We need to encourage the people of the future to develop cooperative skills. And that's why this week I'm going to put this classic co-op game into the board gaming time capsule. Forbidden Island. Forbidden Island is a cooperative game for two to four people. In it you play adventurers who are scrabbling to escape a rapidly sinking island. Now, everyone talks about the outstanding value for money you get in the Mechs vs Minion box, and they're right, the game's components are amazing. However, I'd argue that Forbidden Island did it first. In the UK, Forbidden Island sells for around £15 a copy, and for that, you get all this cool stuff. Cardboard tiles, two decks of cards, a tracker thingy, and these four funky statues. Quick tip, don't stick this one up your nose, it's really tricky to get back out again. You also get a very functional insert and this tin to keep it all in. And not only do you get a lot of components, but they're really high quality too. Just look at this stunning artwork. And on top of all that, Forbidden Island is a really great game. It's accessible, tense and elegantly designed. It's a superb gateway game and a wonderful family game. Now, compare that with some of the other games you can get for around £15. Batman Love Letter. A couple of dozen cards with a theme that's not so much pasted on as restrained against its will. And Maths Flux. Maths Flux. Maths and Flux. Oh, man. So, while Forbidden Island is a small game, it's certainly one with incredibly high production values. And as the kids might say, it's well wicked and monster blinged out. And so, all that's left to do is to pop Forbidden Island into our board gaming time capsule. Alright everybody, that's going to do it for us here for this episode of Board Game Blender. Thank you very much for tuning in, I appreciate it. A big thanks to all my contributors as always. If you have an idea for Board Game Blender episode, or if you have a great idea for a segment, let me know. Email me. And it's quite possible that we could have an episode featuring that topic. Or maybe you could even become a contributor yourself if you have a, a great idea for a segment. So that's going to do it for us. We'll see you again in a couple of weeks. And as always, stay a friend of the bland. I'll see you next time.